Hey, what's going on, everybody? It's episode 118 of the Audible Farm Podcast, and this episode is brought to you by Couchtown Coffee. Couchtown Coffee is roasted right here in Iowa, and they will roast coffee for you, ship it to your house, and all you got to do is grind it up and brew it. It's, it's going to be the best coffee you've made at your house this year. I guarantee it. You don't believe me? Check it out. Go to CouchtownCoffee.com, find a coffee you like, and make an order. You can make an order and save 20% by just using the code word Audible Farm. That's right. You can save 20%. Why? Because Couchtown Coffee is that awesome. They love live music. So do we. So give them a little bit of uh, support here over the holidays and uh, maybe gift some coffee to somebody. Gift some coffee to yourself. I mean, that's, that's the real gift. Treat yourself. Couchtown Coffee. Uh, thanks, Couchtown. Appreciate the uh, sponsorship this week and every week. I'm sitting down this week with Billy Lynn. Billy Lynn, I've known him for quite a while. I've known him since the days back where there were the H-Town Hooligans, and that was the band that he was in at the time when I kind of got more, acquaint- more acquainted with him. And uh, we discussed that band kind of forming, kind of falling apart. Uh, out of the ashes of that band starts a new band. Uh, we also talk about Flash Mob Suicide, another project that he's working on, as well as his other band, The Screaming Artichokes. So currently he's in two bands, um, maybe even more side projects than we know about. He's always busy. He's always writing songs. He's, uh, like I said, a very busy musical individual. He's He buddies up with everybody. He's, he's pretty pretty well known in the music scene and he likes to try to go out and meet new people so it's kind of cool to to sit down and talk with him about you know how he writes songs and meets up with people and does all this stuff so uh, it was a good chance to sit down and talk with Billy Lynn and I'm glad we finally got to do it because we've been trying to do this one for a while so I hope you guys enjoy it I did it's episode 118 with Billy Lynn it's the audible farm podcast with your host Peter Stockdale Ah, today I'm sitting down with Billy Lynn. Billy, uh, you you know you and I come from the same town ish, I guess. Like you spent a lot of your adult life in the the Humboldt area. That's kind of where I was raised, and you know we both hang our hats here a little bit. So that was something that I've known you for a long time. I've known you for you know almost ten, fifteen years, something like that. Now, uh, pretty much the whole time you've been playing music, yeah. and uh, you know it's one of those things I've always known you as like one of the musicians around town. I mean, um, one of the bands that you played in a lot even took their namesake from the town we're from, and you called yourselves the H-Town Hooligans. And I always thought that was kind of cool. Um, you know, let's start out somewhere at the beginning, though. Like, how did you first pick up an instrument? Were you, like, playing in junior high and you did the trumpet or something, or did you have, like, somebody in your family that played a lot of instruments? Well, my dad, he's uh, he's been around for a long time. He was in the, uh, Johnny's 8th Street Buzz Band. Johnny's 8th Street Buzz Band. So, like, what what kind of years are we talking here? Like, 70s, 80s, 90s? 77. Nice. That was, they went on the gong show in 77. What? Yeah. Gene Walker, Mike Prophet, and the, the list goes on. It was a pretty good band around Fort Dodge area for a long time. That's crazy. And they all just kind of went off on their own ski band. You came ski band and MGC, you know. Or, oh, cool. I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't know that. So, your dad's got ties to... Like the MGCC and the ski band, obviously. Any mm-hmm. like those are you know powerhouses around the area. You know, it's pretty much how I met everybody around here. You know, like the cave band and stuff growing up. And oh yeah, yeah, and yeah. I was always just hanging out. You know, I'm always there helping put equipment on stage. And I was a 16 year old kid hiding in the bars. You know, yeah, <laughs> dad would let me in. And so you started out pretty much as a roadie almost. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> Just always loved music, though, ever since I can remember. I was four years old, and they got a picture of me with headphones on, and I'd, Mom would tell me to, what to go pick out the albums, and I'd pick out ELO or the Beatles every time, you know? And, that's cool. And that's how she kept me all chill, she just put those headphones on me, and I'd sit there for hours while she cleaned the house. That's like a million times better than putting someone in front of a TV, uh-huh. you know? Like, hey, Billy, you're not watching Paw Patrol. Guess what? You're listening to ELO, you know? Mm-hmm. And you're over there just like, I turn this down, and you go to turn this down. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I love ELO. That's awesome. That's another one. It's like weird guilty pleasures like that. Like ELO, like it doesn't really fit the mold for, you can't really call it rock, but it's not really like orchestral type stuff, but it's, it's somewhere in there. And ELO has always been one of my, I call them guilty pleasures, but yeah, I can't just put 
one genre on anything I like, you know, it's just, I love everything about music, any kind of music, every type of music. How know? do you think that happened? Because not everyone's like that. I mean, I'll, I'll admit that know. I'm not necessarily like that. The older I get, the more I, I enjoy stuff, especially if it's live. I but. guess I'm a chameleon, you know, I just I always try to fit in with there are certain people and I enjoy what they listen to and they're all, and you know, I, I'm always about music. So whenever I talk to people, they're like, Hey, have you heard this band or have you done this? You know, and mm -hmm. I always give it a chance. And just like I do with, musicians around here and they show you something i'll listen to it that's cool you know i bet some of that open-mindedness lends itself you know to an extent to your songwriting because i remember watching h-town hooligan play back in the day and you guys like your songs would be not like punk but you've got an acoustic guitar and you had someone playing leads so there was like had that like rock but not quite rock because you had an acoustic but then you would also like almost rap or like hip-hop kind of stuff over top mm -hmm. of it sometimes i mean it, like you said it was there's no, you couldn't pin it down in one genre at all. Yeah, it's, I try not to. Yeah, I, mean, I try not, try to make it to where people couldn't do that. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and just do what feels good all the time. It doesn't matter if it's rock, country, rap, whatever it is. You know, whatever yeah. fits the emotion or the feeling of that song. You know. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that helps out too when you get like a random audience of people you don't know who who's going to be there, and it's like, well, we've got something for everybody. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe that's even exactly in this... why it came that way too, because we're like, well, somebody's gonna listen to original, and they're gonna the crowd will might fade away, you know, a little bit. So you better throw something in everybody knows. Yeah, right, yep. right After that, and it always yeah. kept them out there, you know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, uh, how did you like pick up your first instrument then? I mean, uh, how'd you go from roadie to to guitar guy? I've always been into trying. Every time I see an instrument, I try to play it or whatever. Um, Actually, I started out playing violin in fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. And what? <laughs> yeah, and then uh, I really liked the bass. I played bass for a long time. There was always some. I was always trying to just be the singer in the band, but I always needed a bassist. And I was like, "Hey, I'm gonna play bass." And I tried out for a few bands and played bass for a while. And, and not till like H Town Hooligans did I really just get a guitar out and actually learn it. Oh, no way! I didn't know that. That's yeah. wild. Um, like. I guess I just always considered you, like, I always just thought you played the guitar. I don't know. I mean, I guess about the time I met you was probably about the time you were starting to learn how to play and stuff. I love guitars. You know, they're <laughs> beautiful to look at. They're, I mean, next to a woman, you know, that's the yeah. most beautiful thing on earth as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> I, I've, you know, I'm, I'm with you because I think car guys and guitar guys are kind, kind of, of look, same. yeah, they're kind of looking at the same stuff, you know, mm -hmm. it's a... Uh, Look at the color of this, you know, and look at the angles, and, but and then the curves that don't match the straight angles, you know, and mm -hmm. it's uh, it's all about that kind of stuff. And so, like, you pick up a guitar, you kind of start H Town Hooligans. How how are you? How did you go into this? Were you like, I'm fresh, let's just see what happens, or like, well, you, was, you already know a little bit about music? So yeah, I was in the band Caddy Wampus. I don't know if you guys remember, if you remember Caddy Wampus. I don't. Know. But after that broke up, we were, I was just kind of like. I miss my guys, you know, and I was working at Rustics and starting to book bands in there and everything. And I was like, man, I really wish I was up there playing with them. Mm -hmm. So I just got my buddies together and it happened, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, how does uh, H-Town Hooligans start out? Like, who all do you put in the band? Because I know there was like a, a few lineup changes, but you did have a pretty steady lineup for quite a while. The original idea of it was to be able to almost be like an open mic band every time we played, like somebody would come up and play. And that's how, you know, Stephanie used to come up and play with us and all the time, you know. And uh, I don't know, it just. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I got a brain block there. For no, that's cool. That's cool. What was the uh, original question? <laughs> like, who, like, who all was in the band? How did it like all start out? Did you, I know you said you just got some of your uh, buddies together, but like, I know, like, Matt Stubbs was like the drummer for a while. Yeah, Matt Stubbs is my my best friend, and um, somebody had a kit in his base. Uh, Tony Carlson had a kit in his basement, and we just started playing. And next thing led to another, and then Scotty came into the picture. And Mike Debevic, the bassist, I, he's he's I've known him since I was 11 years old. He's actually my uncle at one point, and everything. <laughs> and, and so he's always been the bassist. Yep. Just one day I said, "You're playing bass," and he's like, "Okay." And he played bass with me up until uh, Screaming Artichokes. Oh, nice. That's cool. Yeah, I, I remember, you know, I remember all these guys. I saw you guys play dozens of times, you know, in, in the area around here when I was growing up. Um, I want to just say Scotty was 
uh, Justin Rasmussen, you know, mm-hmm. for people. Yeah, that don't I know. didn't know his name till like a year <laughs> later, and somebody goes, "Oh, you're hanging out with Jr." I was like, "Who the hell is that?" Yeah, that's, that's even things where if I said Justin Rasmussen, people don't even know who that is. They just right. know him as Jr. So, mm-hmm. but yeah, that was another one of those things. I remember I I had a job and I worked with him for a while, and he was like, oh, "I'm starting to play the guitar," and he was another one of those guys that just kind of dinked around with music. You know, he I don't know if he took piano lessons or something, but he he could just like sit down on an instrument for a while and just be like, "This is." kind of a song right you know this fits together and it's like yeah it does but like what are you doing i don't know i'm just i just played it you know anything you give him he would he would figure it out he would like, yeah i've seen him play piano drums bass i've seen him do it all and he's never had any training in any of it you know he just figures it out yeah yeah i mean that's that was another one of those cool things was to have uh as far as I was concerned, you guys were like all just regular guys that I knew before you had a band. So it was also really cool to see just a bunch of regular guys that weren't like, you know, just rock stars that appeared out of nowhere. And it was like, I know these guys, these guys are cool. You know, they're all regular guys doing this thing. That's really cool. And you know, um, like while you guys were doing the whole H town hooligans thing, I, I had played guitar for a while and then just kind of, just kind of quit, you know, but it was kind of cool to see you guys out there like going and doing this thing. It's like, Oh, people from a small town in Iowa can do this, you know, and, and make a couple bucks and like, you know, get bookings around the state. And it was, it was really cool to see that, you know, and, yeah. um, I learned a lot from it. Yeah. Yeah. I bet, you know, um, heading up a band is probably not an easy thing. It's not like you were the, the main guy, the figurehead, the, this is my band or go away kind of dude. But you know, it's, it kind of was your, your project from the start. So I'm sure it's hard to like, I mean, that was kind of, that's what I feel like has always been my forte is getting the people together and figuring out what we're going to do. And and it's like, it was fun. And then the finished product, you know, I could almost walk away from it because it's done. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, man. Um, So I know the band ended up going through some lineup changes and eventually kind of just falling apart Um, from the, ironically from the ashes of H-Town Hooligans comes the band that everybody knows now as riddled with class, even though there's like no lineup similarities or anything. It was like Danza. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, as, as you guys fell apart, Danza had this thing and then he just switched the name because he was the last guy there and took it a different direction. And it's kind of, that's like one of my great, it's one of my favorite stories. It's great. I, I absolutely love that story about those guys and like, and you and how, you know, I mean, you always hear about like, oh, did you know that, you know, Dave Mustaine was in Metallica and then he <laughs> left and, st- and it's like, and you guys have this, you know, a humble version of that, which yeah, is right. really cool. You know, um, if anybody like doesn't even, you know, if oh, I don't remember H-Town Hooligans or if you think it's something like that, there's actually a couple of videos of your guys like up on the Audible Farm channel. I actually, you know, RWC used to be like our, um, our side project when we were in H-Town Hooligans when like Jed and everybody would come over and this is our band we're going to call RWC. You yeah. Know? That was, that was, uh, Jed came up with that name actually. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, man. I, uh, I actually like, he comes up with some good stuff. I've stolen some things from him and he knows that too. And I was like, <laughs> I'm sorry. I stole that lyric. Cause I, I heard you singing it and I really liked it and it fit and it's actually on the album now. So there you go. Kudos. <laughs> <laughs> You know, that's really cool, though, that, like, uh, even though while you have, like, one band, you can kind of still have a side project with other people, and you're never really, like, you know, you're never really, like, putting all of your eggs in this one basket, sink or swim kind of deal. You're just, you're always working on something else and going to the next thing. I can't help it. Yeah. <laughs> we were talking about that a little bit before the podcast, how, like, you've always been a songwriter. I mean, um, you're just cranking out songs all the time, even when you didn't really have a band necessarily you know you'd you found a way to like cobble together like hey you play guitar play on this thing for me and you know you you found a way to cobble together music still and, and upload it um a lot of that you uploaded under the the name flash mob suicide is that what that kind of came about oh, as well or? flash mob suicide is lane bailey basically i put lyrics on it and i help with ideas and guitar and every once in a while but he pretty much produces everything and engineers it and we're working towards being a live band and we're starting to write together and everything and see how that turns out but lane bailey is the guy on that flash mob so oh cool so cool cool he's really good at what he does well, that's where all that stuff comes from mm-hmm. i was gonna say I, I knew you were like collaborating with people like uh, on the side and yeah like uh jeremy ray he used to play my dad's band and he he works down at drake university and uh does uh recording text down there i went and recorded a song for my dad uh, about a year ago there with him and a couple of other musicians mm-hmm. but yeah i if if i hear of a place where i can go record one of my original songs because i got a million of them i'll do it <laughs> drop well, of the hat i mean uh 
I mean, we're recording stuff right now. Um, I can't tell you it's going to be like high quality, super awesome stuff. But I mean, if you want a demo, I could help you record at least like a set of demos. But I also do know some people that do some recording um, that is very good, cost money. But, you know, that's just the way it goes. Um, and I've been down to Otho and everything and yeah. paid for that. That's a lot of fun. Dude, doing that. yeah, dude. It's, uh, it's something else doing the analog thing. Two albums there. One with a band called I-9. You know, oh, really? Catfish is. Jeez, how many bands have you been in? <laughs> Oh, you know, a lot. <laughs> Most of them didn't even get off the ground. We just got together and jammed, talked about being a band more more or less, talked about it than actually doing it. But, mm-hmm. you know, and some things work, some things don't, you know. And if you know it's not going to work, you move on to the next idea, you know. Yeah, true. Um, there is something to be said about that, like having the correct chemistry mm-hmm. with, like, a group of people. And even though, you know, like, you might get together and the chemistry is awesome, but two, three, four, five years down the road might not be or something like that, you know, and you start to run into the situation where, like, we needed to switch this up a little bit. That was definitely a thing about H. Sean Hooligans. We were all brothers, you know, and mm-hmm. we all got along, and we, we we knew each other's mistakes and everything, and, and it just gelled. And I think I really feel like I found that with uh, Screaming Artichokes again, you know. Yeah, yeah, Screaming Artichokes, quite obviously being the the new band you're in. Yeah. You guys played at the Rock and Picnic this last year, which is a... Uh, for people listening to this for the first time, the Rock and Picnic is a, a festival that happens in Humboldt. Um, uh, Labor Day weekend, it's on a s- Saturday night, and then the following Sunday, and there's about a dozen bands or so, and you know, food and, and hanging out and camping and, and live music and all sorts of good stuff. And you guys were one of the bands. You guys filled an hour and a half time slot, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Was it that long? It was It was at least an hour. You guys were one of the hour bands. I felt like I got up there and it was done. <laughs> you know, I was so nervous right beforehand. Because it had been a long time since I played in front of anybody, you know. Yeah, how long had it been? Like since H-Town Hooligan days? or? Uh, well, the Screaming Artichokes was a three-man band at first. It was my friend Mike D and uh, uh, Laurent Tate. And we did a few shows back in the day when uh, down in... What was it, Gina's? Uh, oh, Patty's. Patty's, yeah. Yep. We played a couple shows there and just kind of went our different separate ways after that. Yeah, okay. So then you just like, you know, take keep the name, reform the band a little bit, yeah. to start over from scratch, and there you go. Yeah. Um, you, I, I think it's fun playing the rock and picnic, but it is like also a little nerve wracking when you're, when you, like you and I live in a small ish town and when, a decent portion of the town shows up to watch this event because it's like the event of the weekend. It's kind of weird because you're just like, there's a pile of people here I know. And a whole my boss. Yeah, <laughs> there's a pile of people here I don't know that live in this town and they're all going to know me from now on. I'm going to have to behave. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, you know, that is like one of the fun parts about going to the Rock and Picnic though is everybody, you know, everybody just gets along for the most part. I mean, there's, I was talking with Scott about it. Um, this you know maybe like 10 or 15 episodes ago and it's like there's maybe been like one incident it was like two years into the event and since then nobody's ever like nobody's ever like even argued with anybody or yelled at anybody at the whole event it's like that's pretty wild to have like you were on a day and a half long event and there's never even a hang up at all you never have to cart anyone out or nothing you know and that's like one of my favorite things about playing the rock and picnic is it's just a really really good vibe there you know everybody's but he's pretty happy with one another. All the musicians are really supportive of one another. And it's not like musicians aren't usually supportive, but you know, there's always like memes about like, this is the best, you know, this is the best compliment you can get from another musician. It's just a kid going <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, so musicians can be a little bit, you know, that's the most nerve wracking part to be honest. Yeah. 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 Playing rock and picnic, knowing that there's phenomenal musicians out there, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's not that, I mean, it's not that we're not phenomenal, but they do also like the last, this last year they had. I think I'm phenomenal. (laughs) (laughs) The phenomenal Billy Lynn. (laughs) I'm a mediocre guitarist and a mediocre singer together. It's good. (laughs) It's all right. Oh my gosh. That's, that's hilarious. That's, you know, there's something about that though. The fact that you have. Um, we were talking about earlier, you got the guts to actually go out there and do it though. You know, and there's so many people that don't, um, like I said, before the podcast episode, we were talking about how like I write music and my, the music I write is, is not good compared to other people's music. I'll be the first to admit that, but I think because I'm, I don't do enough of it. So I don't have the chance to like really get good at figuring out how to like put a song together to make it really sound good, you know? But you know, in your situation, I mean, I don't, I don't know what you're doing, cranking out a new song every week, something like that. I don't know. Like, 
It's easy. I don't know. It just really feels easy. I'll just be sitting there diddling around on a guitar, you know, and I, I come up with a riff and I, I like it and I'll start humming to it and humming to it. And then I'll think of something I want to write about and I'll take those, that melody that I hummed with that guitar and write a song. I, I don't know. I don't like, I don't, I don't know how you guys do it. I don't know. How everybody does it. I do it different with Flash Mob Suicide. They actually, he actually writes a song and then presents it to me, and then I sit there and I go, "Here's the lyrics." Okay, all right. So you know he's he's kind of like already got like a pre-made thing, and you're just adding the seasonings on it there. Yeah, it's easy. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I like it. That's that's pretty awesome. Then you don't have to do the work of like trying to come up with the riffs on your own. Somebody else is already doing all the mm-hmm. riff work. That's that's pretty cool. I mean, I don't know if it's the way that you know, your brain works. There's a couple other people I know that are in like Iowa music, Facebook groups and things like that, that are just like, wrote a song this week. Here you go. And it's like, how, how did you write that? You know, I mean, the song's not like insanely super complicated, but it's like, I couldn't even write that. You could have given me a month to do that. And I could have written that, you know, <laughs> like, and I don't know how you guys do it. I, I've always said that, you know, and you know, you're definitely one of those singer songwriter types that um, you can go out there and sing your own tunes and write your own tunes. And they're, they're meaningful to you, yet ambiguous enough that they can be meaningful to other ambiguous. people. Ambiguous. I was looking for that word one day. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, that's that's another thing I like, you know, about uh, some of your lyric writing is uh, you can talk about some of your songs, like, um, talk about, like, this is a day in the life of me, but it's like, you're not being so specific that it's taking other people out of... No, you got to relate to your audience and have them be able to relate to it and to something in their life, just like any other song on the radio, you know? It, it might mean something to me but it might mean something totally different to you when you hear it, you know? Yeah, definitely. I mean, is that something Just that... depending on what you're going through, I guess, you know? Yeah. I mean, did that, did that come natural to you or something? Or, because I mean, it's not that every song doesn't do it, but I feel like a lot of the uh, um, colorful euphemisms have kind of gone away in music when you listen to it today. People are so direct with their lyrics and it's like, yeah, yeah try and hide what you're saying a little bit, you know? Yeah. I don't know. That that thought th- 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 process has always been there you know Mm -hmm. just when i write i always think about that because i don't really want to it's it's almost if they knew what it was about it almost be embarrassing you know what i mean yeah because it's so personal and it's 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 really it's really coming from a place you know i uh i remember grilling jeremy ober about that once not on the mic but it was just like what's this song about he's like you'll never know nobody's ever gonna know and it was like all right, fair. You know, like it could be about something super trivial and nonsense, you know, that no one else would ever care about, you know? Every once in a while, I'll tell somebody in the band what the song's about, and they're like, what? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, don't tell nobody. <laughs> they're just like, don't worry, we won't. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to tell anybody that. That's weird. <laughs> <laughs> no, this, this song's about money. No, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I, I I really do look up to you singer songwriter types though, and uh, one of the places I get to see a lot of you guys play is at jam nights, you know, and and recently you went to Barnum to the jam night. Um, I was there, and you went to your first jam night, and you were just kind of like, eh, I'm not gonna play, and you still went up there and ended up playing, you know, yeah. and um, we'll kind of circle back to that. Some of that comes from like the nerves. I will have to say, I went to I went to a handful of jam nights in Barnum before I had the guts to go up there i don't know why i have like this weird nervous about playing in front of people and being around them that's probably why i played in des moines because like well nobody down, down here knows me so i can just play on here all i want and then just walk away and drive two hours home but it's a little different when you're like in your own backyard so i always thought it was kind of weird going up and playing i was always super nervous and people oh get up here and play the guitar's right there and it's like yeah eh, maybe next week you know and i know that you're kind of like me a little bit in that aspect where you're just like i don't know if i want to get up there you know and um how did how did you end up like overcoming that at the jam night i guess i don't think i ever really overcome it i just tackle it head on you know because mm-hmm. i have social anxiety really bad mm-hmm. and i and i have to take pills for it now and then you know mm-hmm. so i even have a hard time just going to a bar let alone getting in front of people and singing yeah yeah uh, I, can, I can imagine that like even if you're in a room where nobody's paying attention to you sometimes you feel like everyone's looking at you it also helped that stephanie was in there going you're a little bitch <laughs> <laughs> tough love from get the, up there tough love from the other singer yeah, in the like, band yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh that's hilarious though i do i did think that was pretty funny that like uh like three of the people from the screaming artichokes came to the jam in barnum and you guys played a couple songs together you guys played a couple songs not not with each other it was really fun to see you guys kind of get up there and mix it up plus like you said you kind of had 
Stephanie and Will there to kind of just be like, just get up there and play. Just go up there and play. And yeah. Stephanie's definitely like that, though. <laughs> it was like the they went the last week, mm-hmm. and they told me about it. I was like, I got to go. It yeah. sounds like fun. And, yeah. And I've known Will forever, too, just like I've known you forever. But, you know, something I never knew about him is that he's – that talented i didn't know he was i never knew yeah talked to him a million times never knew yeah he and w- every time i see him play he impresses me every time and like we we're last night getting on the drums playing bass guitar he, yep he was in his zone man he loves it yeah i, I think it's I really love f- watching that growing up in high school it was like i play guitar and everyone was just like up oh, here plays guitar woo and like will never once out loud said he was a guitar player but he was better than everyone else in high school you know um, we grew up and he was playing like Metallica and stuff like that in high school, you know, and I'm over here playing punk rock. Look, I am so cool. And Will's just doesn't even mention it to everyone. He's just over here shredding by himself. You know, I, know. And I, I really respect that of people that just don't go out and say anything about it. You know, it's just something. It's, wow. You know? Yeah. I, I don't know. I'm not that outspoken, but I, I sure will. Uh, share it all over Facebook that I'm in a band and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he don't talk about it. Yeah, yeah. That's you know, it takes something you know to be. I I I honestly think it's modesty. You know, because like yeah. it's tough to. I, that's what I'm saying I wish I was more modest. Yeah, it's, it's tough to get a little bit of fame and then just be like. I mean, even if it's tiny minuscule amount in your own hometown, it's tough to get that little bit of fame and just be like, eh, whatever. And then you're always treading on that line of arrogance and confidence, you know? Yes. How do I, how do I be confident but not look arrogant, you know? Yeah, but you can't also be like, I'm in a band, it's whatever, they suck. I mean, we're, you know, it's whatever, we just, we play sometimes, whatever. You oh, know? you've heard me talk before. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can't do that either because then people are just like, I'm not going to listen to this crap, you know, like, and, and I totally get it. I a hundred percent get it, you know? Um, but that's one of those weird things about trying to find that right amount of, you know, how cool is this thing, you know, or, or how cool am I for doing this? And sometimes you just, you just let other people decide, you know, it's like, I'm in a band. This is the stuff. Listen to it. If you want to you know, check it out, you know, if you don't want to cool too, you know, like, mm-hmm. and then just leave it up to somebody else. But like, Will was always one of those secret, you know, He's better than he lets on, like 100% better than he lets on. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's out of his element going to a jam night. It's not, you know, jam nights are weird because if you want to play along, it's like, what song are we playing? Like, what are the what are the chords? Like, I've never heard this before. Like, where are the switches? It's, I don't know. Like, and so, you know, you get up there and it's like, uh, I think he's in, he's an E minor, Will. And Will's just like, got it. And he just... And he goes, you know, he mm-hmm. figures it out, but it gets kind of weird when someone's like, there's a capo on the seventh fret, and then we're starting with a B, and it's like, what, you know? And that's when I, like, I have to sit there in my head and, like, you know, count it all out, and I'm like, all right, this is the key they're in, you know? And sometimes it takes a little bit of work to get to that level um, to try to figure out what key people are in, but, I mean, Will, like, his first couple times up there at jam night, it's just, like, just hit him with a couple easy songs to get him comfortable, because that's what people did for me, you know, mm-hmm. and... Then after, before you know it, it's like, well, Will's playing guitar. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna sit down, you know. And uh, Dan Blair goes to jam nights there too, and he, he plays a lot of guitar at jam nights. And usually, if you know, if he's not playing, I'm playing. It was kind of fun this last week because there was no Dan, so I, I played. But it was just like everybody else, whoever else wants to play, just get up there and play the lead guitar. And you know, sometimes we didn't even have lead guitar, but you know, it's cool to have Will up there and and Stephanie and you show up. You know, it's people that I know going into a place that, you know. I I kind of just stumbled into on my own. You know, I met Clint like two years ago, and he's like, oh, we got a jam night. You should swing over. And I just, eh, all right, I guess I will, you know. And it's kind of cool to see people from my hometown swinging down to this jam night that's 25 miles away, you know, in a tiny podunk town. I, uh, I wanted to go bad. <laughs> <laughs> but the reason I like to go to those is, and it, I mean, I'll get up and jam, but uh, I like meeting other musicians, you know. Mm-hmm. There's always aspects to that, like, you can meet, you know, you know, if you're meeting your next lead singer, you know? Yeah. Or if you're meeting your next band member or you're going to do a show together, you just, there's so much networking that can be done talking to all these people, you know? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's how Jesse Wilson is like forming his bands and like recording his singles is. And that was my first time meeting him. And yeah, he's a great guy. I like him. Yeah. He just does the singer songwriter thing and he went to jam nights and. I want to play lead, you know, I want someone to play lead with me when I go play live shows. So he just hit up Debo because, you know, Dan Blair's not in a band. So he's like, you got free time, come play with me, you know. And if I have a free weekend, I'll go play bass with him, you know. And I didn't even recognize him at the Rock rock and Picnic. He Dan? Came, yeah, he came up. 
uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, he's hey Bill. And I was like, <laughs> just this, give him a look. This like this the hair. He's got yeah, hair. he's got the long hair now. Yep. Yeah, he's definitely definitely looks different if you haven't seen him in a few years. That's for sure. But it's he, what's he been doing? He he record or? I actually I do have a, a half recorded demo of his on on right this computer. On. Um, we just need to put drums and and lyrics and bass. But we got like the scratch track, you know, basically laid out. Um, otherwise, he plays with Jesse Jesse Wilson live. You know, they go play a lot of live shows and stuff like that. Like I said, I'll I'll play bass with them if they've got, if, if Jesse plans it out and you know books a three piece, I'll I'll go with him. But otherwise, like he just books a two piece or a solo gig, you know, and Debo plays with him. But other than that, you know, um, I I talked to Dan on episode like, you know, about one hundred and one or something like that on the podcast, and it's like, dude, it's been it's been like a hundred episodes since you've been on the podcast. What have you been up to? And it's like. Not much. And it's like, we need to change that. And I was just like, you're coming to jam night with me next week. So I started taking him to jam nights, you know, and in a matter of a few months, it was just like, he's getting his chops up. People are, you know, noticing his stuff. And Jesse was like, Hey, you want to play, you know, and he's done that even with recorded stuff. Cause Jesse records all his stuff at his house. So he'll record, um, you know, like singles and things like that. And then I'll just be like, this guy plays bass. I've, I've seen him at shows. It's like, you want to just swing over here and record a bass lick for this? And then wham, you just got random dude playing bass or someone, Hey, slap a lead on this and send it back. And that's, it's kind of neat to have that. Like you said, the networking capabilities and it's, there's a whole lot of people there that might not be in bands. I'd love to make a whole album like that. You know, just have every song, just different people all the way through it. Yeah. That would, that would be really cool. Um, let me ask your opinion on this. Do you think full albums are something that's going to go away? They're obsolete now, aren't they? Yeah. I I just released Flash Mob Suicide album, and I put visuals to it and put it on YouTube. There's different ways to go about it now, and, and I think sometimes I feel a little old when it comes to that because I do want the album in my hand and everything, and mm-hmm. I want the CD and everything. But, yeah, Spotify, YouTube, it's, a, it's the way you got to go now, I guess. Yeah. I just um, hope somebody hears it somewhere. Yeah. Um, I miss that physical... Here's a, here's a CD, dude. Check this out. That's true. Um, the only downside to that... You start giving out flash drives. <laughs> that's that's becoming the new thing. You Is know? it? Yeah. People are doing that now. I, I know somebody gave me like their card that has their website on it yeah, and everything. Digital download codes yeah. and things. Um, I went to Elton John um, you know, five, seven years ago when he was in Des Moines, and that was something you could buy. Was It was like 100-some bucks, but it was like a, re- a live recording of the show you went to with like the mixing from the soundboard and all this other nonsense. Oh, wow. And it came on a flash drive, like a Elton John this date in Des Moines, Iowa flash drive or whatever, you know, and they made them for you. And I didn't get one, but, you know, I've, I've seen it even on like CD Baby's website. If you want to make a CD, if you've got like tracks and you're like, I've got the art and I just want them to print me CDs, like flash drives are one of the options they give you. You want to just print, print flash drives. The cool thing about that is you can just pop it in a computer. It's like, here's the art. There's the lyrics. Here's a bonus video or something. Rock and roll. You can stuff a lot of stuff on the flash drive, but yeah. Um, I'm with you though. I like having like physical albums, like holding them in my hand and things like that. But also, um, I'd rather almost have a vinyl in my hand than a CD. Like I'm like a million oh, times yeah, more too. apt to pick up a vinyl now. I don't know why, like I've got, you know, a bazillion CDs, but I don't ever pick any of them up anymore. I've, it's been so long since I've put any sort of a disc into a slot to play it. Those albums I was talking about when I was little. Yep. Still have them. Nice. Nice. Yeah. I'll uh I'll show you a couple of my records that I got around the house here uh, when we're done with the episode, and we've already got we got about a half an hour into this thing. This is this is cooking along nice, dude. This is easier than I thought it was gonna be. <laughs> yeah, I mean we we danced around having you on the podcast for like a year now. You know, uh, I knew you were starting new things and stuff like that. And, uh, I didn't know what to talk about. Yeah, <laughs> there's pl- like, there's plenty of stuff to talk. We're halfway about. in between things, and I'm actually thinking about quitting something. No. <laughs> Well, now you have to talk because you, you did the rock and picnic. Like I said, that was that was tons of fun to see you back up on stage, uh, especially to see like Will up on stage. You know, I went to school with Will and to see him go up there and actually like play guitar in a band and things was, was really fun uh, to have Stephanie up there. And you had the dual singer thing going on. That was really cool to have that, too. Um, Danza played in your band, didn't he? You mm-hmm. know, so that was, was also kind of fun to be like. Oh, there's Danza playing Rock and Picnic again with another different band because he plays every year in a different band. Christian, our drummer, just to put him in there too. Uh, 
I knew him when he was like 16 and he was playing bass in a band called Leaving Carol. And okay. then almost 15 years later, I'm in a band with him. That's know? cool. That's really <laughs> awesome. You know, that comes back to networking. You've been in the scene for so long, you know, so many people. I bet you hit people up where they're just like, I haven't played in five years. You know, that's how long you've been in the scene. That's how many people you know. You know what I love doing? What's like that? Like right now, um, Flash Mob Suicide I needed a bassist so bad, you know? I went to Jimmy Dodger. Oh, yeah? Yeah, he's just learning how to do it, but he's going to learn with us. And oh, that's yeah? That's how he's going to learn. Yeah. Yep, he's our bassist, no no doubt about it. That's cool. That's really cool, actually, to have that, too, to, to give somebody first starting out, um, you know, the opportunity to it's just like, hey, just play this stuff and go with it, you know? And, um, well, like in Three Finger Betty, we need a bassist, and we're kind of trying people out. And the people we're trying out play bass, but they're, they've never been, like, a bassist in a band or anything, you know? So they're... They've primarily been like guitarists or drummers or things like that. And they're just like, I'll play bass. And it's like, well, if you want to, if you want to dedicate yourself to this, we'll, we'll give you a shot, you know? Yeah. So we're giving people a shot. And it's actually, it's pretty fun to watch people play along to a song that's like, oh, you just listened to this like 50 times on the internet and figured out how to play it and showed up and it sounds right, you know? Mm -hmm. It's really kind of neat to have that, you know, have people come in there and, and really surprise you like that. Because I know Jimmy's been playing, you know, yeah. but... Um, I, he's like we said, he's never been in a band or anything like that before. He was always there with us, and he'd get free drinks because they thought he was in the band all the time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he just he'd just go with it. Was, he's like, "Is it all right? Uh, go with it, man. Get a drink." <laughs> Dude, the free drinks in the band thing is like the funniest thing ever. I mean, I've I've gone places where like bands drink for free, and it's like I want a soda, and they're like, "Well, you got to pay for that." And it's like. <laughs> So I can get a soda with alcohol in it for free, but I can't just get a soda for free. I mean, I've, I've run into like the weirdest things with the band's drink for free. And then I quit drinking, you know, um, or I, I guess I don't drink at shows or I guess I, don't, I haven't drank in years, but um, it, like people would just buy me drinks and stuff and like set them next to my guitars and things. And it's just like, so when you want this drink, <laughs> you know, you just walk over, and give it to somebody else. Uh, I started taking to do it and, like just tonic water with a lime in it and people think you got like a vodka lime but then like the worst part about that is like you're just like oh i got a drink but then people just like i'll buy your next one and the next one's a vodka lime and you're just like oh no i can <laughs> smell it. this i can smell this coming off of here i learned over the years too the space uh with uh, h john hogan's we don't have to go into the stories, but there's reasons I quit drinking before we played live, too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's nice to have a few, you know, maybe get get the muscles relaxed. But we were playing in Eagle Grove one time. They were just lining up shots and shots and <laughs> shots. And, and I'll say, I'll, I will say this. It's really fun. Thank you, everybody that does buy drinks yes, for bands. It's, it's awesome. really cool to have that happen. It's a little weird when it's like oh, there's 40 shots and there's four of you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was hearing a story from somebody that they were talking about, like, it like closer to the end of the night, it almost becomes work, you know, when they start buying you drinks and it's like, I don't want any more drinks. You know, it's, I got another hour to play here, buddy, you know? And so then before you know, it, you just got a table and it's like, it's got a glass of beer and like a, a beer bottle and just like, I'm not going to drink anymore. <laughs> like, uh, Caddy Wampus, we were playing, we were doing a benefit for, uh, I put together a benefit for the uh, skate park and we had a bunch of bands play there when it was still Mrs. G's back then. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And we were playing, and uh, I uh, the music starts to go a little wonky, so I'm, like, singing. And I look back, and my guitarist, he's just looking at me, and he, he flips me off. And he looks at the drummer, flips him off, and then just falls over face first. On the grass. <laughs> <laughs> he said it felt like he was on a pedestal, and he was just trying to stay straight on it. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, we stopped drinking at shows. <laughs> yeah. And, I mean... I've talked to a couple other guys in bands and they would, they would tell stories about things, you know, like that, where it's just like, man, this is not a good representation of like our band. You know, people are going to remember our band and remember this and be like, yeah. this is what those guys do. And the other bad thing about that is like other people in the band are like, I have to stand next to this guy while he's doing this stuff, you know, and it's no offense to people that have, you know, you know done things like that at shows, but like, it's, it is a little weird. It's like, man, it makes you really think kind of being in a band sometimes when you're with somebody that's a little bit more, uh, free spirited, I guess will be the nicest way to say it. Um, Just a little of hand. Yeah. It gets a little out of hand. That's a, that's a nice way of saying it, but that's you why know, I don't drink. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, honestly, like some of that, and it was just like, I can't, I can't in all honesty go down to Des Moines and have like four beers and then drive home. You know, it just doesn't make sense to me. So it's like, 
I got I'm just having Coca-Cola. Thank you. I'll appreciate that very much, you know. And there's a reason my band Katie Wampus wasn't allowed at Lehigh anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so Billy's got stories, everybody. If you go to a screaming artist show, <laughs> show, drag Billy to the side and say, Tell me some of those stories. I've got to know. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's a lot of them. <laughs> you do have uh, you know, you do have any shows booked for Screaming Artichokes? Any plans for the future? Do you have anything kind of... I mean, I know you did the Rock and Picnic. Was that just kind of a one-off deal, or do you plan on on taking this? Uh, Definitely plan on it. And um, I just put on Facebook the other day, that, and I hope other bands do this too, with all the businesses being down and everything and have to reboot and everything. I, I want our bands to do a few free shows for some local bars and stuff and help them get back on their feet. Maybe, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. hopefully that'll help some people, but yeah, I'm looking forward to do some free shows for some people. Yeah. Oh, that'd be cool. Um, if any people have venues are looking mm -hmm. for a band, uh, that'll, that'll play pro bono hit up Billy Lynn. He's, he's the guy to talk to. I probably shouldn't have done that, but yeah, we want to do that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> hit him up while you can, you know, you might, you might have, you might have 10 bookings before you know it. And you might have to be like, well, I rescind the offer, you know, but tour two twenty one. Yeah. <laughs> All free. Uh, <laughs> my wife will kill me. <laughs> oh my gosh. No, but I mean, that's a, that's a noble thing to do. Some bands have done that for places they play at a lot. Um, I know, I mean, it's not like we did it a hundred percent pro bono. We took, you know, the, the whole, like, if you're watching online, you can shoot us a tip or something. We did that for a couple shows, but, you know, you know, didn't take anything at the door because it's like, we don't know what's coming. So we'll just, we'll just come here and play for tips pretty much and see what happens. And, you know, it, it worked out in the favor of, of the bar and, and less for us, but there's been times where it's been more in our favor and less in the bar's favor. So, you know, you just take, you just take it as it comes. And especially for like hometown places where it's like, I don't want, you know, the poor house to close in Humboldt because I got live music, you know, mm -hmm. and it might be beneficial to do a, you know, a, a free show there, especially for you guys where you're all semi-local, you know, no one's got to drive two hours to get to a gig. It's a little bit easier to do a pro bono show, you know? Yeah. I can't play, wait, wait to play there again. Yeah. When was the last time you played at the, I mean, it was, it, have you played at the poor house since it was the poor house? Yeah, actually, um, um, me and the drummer, from the original Screaming Our Chokes, we played an hour for a rapper called Poet Hendrix. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. Yeah, I remember that now. Yeah. I was not there, but I do remember that that happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was videos everywhere, all over the internet. I remember I... <laughs> well, I mean, it's. I mean, it, if it pe people not watching the video, it, it, yeah, you missed the you missed the joke. <laughs> but it was you know, a Randy night. <laughs> well, it ha it happens, man. It happens. It's just the it's just the well, way it goes. But we just we we hadn't even played together forever. But I knew that uh, he could only fill about an hour, so he'd have to have somebody fill an hour in. And I was like, "You want to play with me?" And he's like, "Sure." And we just we didn't even practice. We just went there and played. Yeah. You and I were actually talking about that last night, how like doing those shotgun shows, like is so nerve wracking. Sometimes they go really well, sometimes not, probably not our preferred method of doing things, you know, because, because no. I mean, I played rock and picnic once with Dan and we programmed some backing tracks and stuff into like a little beatbox I had. And it was just us two playing leads over top of blues songs and singing them and stuff. So like one would play rhythm, one would play lead, and then we'd swap or whatever, you know, and, and that worked, but we only had a, a couple of weeks to do it, you know, and it was, it was in the matter of time where it's like, you know, let's figure out what songs we're going to do, then practice them. And then we'll come back in a week and hash them all out over the next week. And, you know, and the, the day of the rock and picnic, me and Dan are here, you know, in my basement, just, just going over the songs over and over and over again. And it's like, I wish we had more time, you know, doing this shotgun style, doing all the work days beforehand is not done that quite a few times yeah it's like i said it's not always good it's not always bad you know and when it works out it's great but it's god dang if if you, people like you and i weren't already nervous enough to go up there and play and then you got to go through that and it's like oh, i'm sweating bullets now <laughs> you know and kudos to you for showing up at a jam night too and playing songs i know you were playing like with a shell of your your band but like you had to go up there and play with musicians you didn't know you know or maybe play songs that not everybody else in the you know playing with you knew. Maybe the drummer didn't know it or something, you know. So it's just kind of like, well, look for the changes, I guess, you know. And what was that movie Highlander where they used to, where they used to um, 
steal somebody's power, you know, yep. and all that stuff. I feel that's how, how I feel when you play with another musician because you're always going to learn something from somebody. And you're always taking powers from everybody, you know. Dude, a million percent. I'm the Highlander of music. <laughs> <laughs> there can be only one. I am a murder! Um, no, <laughs> no, that's 100% true. I think that has something to do with me liking live music of all genres. Like I said earlier, I'm kind of picky about the music I like, but when I go see people play live, it's like, I'm not really into bluegrass and stuff. And then you like watch me like, these guys are shredding. These guys are absolutely shredding. It and I don't know. I don't have the slightest clue how they're doing it, you know? And then you're just like, Oh, I got, I got stuff to learn, you know? And I, yeah. I still haven't learned it, but it's still like, dude, there's, there's so much stuff to learn. Even if you're playing with people who are like in your talent area, you know, like, that's how I kind of got good was like me and Dan Blair would just like sit down and it's like, what'd you learn this week? It's like this. And it's like, neat. You know, I'm learning that now. And then it's just like, what'd you learn this week? It's like, I learned this. And before you know it, you learn twice as much in a week because you're kind of just trading stuff with yeah, people. And you, you're taking something from, yeah, like yeah. I said, yeah. you're a Highlander. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We're all Highlanders. <laughs> Dude, this is awesome. This is so awesome. Flash Mob Suicide, you guys got social media or, uh, Screaming Artichokes got social media. Flash does Flash Mob have social media? Yeah, we're we're on Facebook and YouTube. I, uh, I knew you had the YouTube so channel. Many YouTube videos on there. I, I, I don't. I just want to put it out there, so I just hurry up and make a video and just put it on there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, have you ever thought about? I know you're doing. Uh, it's kind of like ambient background video. Have you ever thought about doing like a dedicated music video to any of those songs? Like sitting down and being like, let's record somebody like going through a day in the life of whatever, you know, or whatever people's music videos are. I'd really nowadays. like to get into that more, uh, more of the making videos and, but I, I, I don't, I don't know if I have the time for that. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to find somebody professional and do it, you know? Yeah. You know, yeah. One of these days. Dude, I, I will have to say I'm, I'm a, I'm like a, such a huge proponent of DIY. I help people with DIY stuff. Um, a lot of times pro bono probably shouldn't do that. But I have also been in bands where like they do things the quote unquote professional way of just hiring somebody that knows what they're doing and letting them do it. And oh my God, it's so easy to let someone else do the work. And then you're just like, oh, damn, this is way better than I would have done. And then you're like, cool, sweet. You know, so it's kind of painful to pay the money or to like have someone else do the work for you. And yes, yeah, so I got Lane Bailey. <laughs> he does it all for me. Smart, smart. Yeah, we're trying to do that live, you know. Mm hmm. Yeah. How do you, uh, do you guys have like a full band dedicated out for that? Or like, yeah, what are your thought got, uh, process for Tom St Stringer's playing drums, Jim's playing bass, Lane Bailey's on guitar, John Bowman's on the other guitar. Oh, cool. So we're working on it. We just kind of took a break for, you know, holidays and COVID, you know, we just yeah. kind of haven't been able to get together with anybody right now. But once, once January comes around, we're going to go full swing and you'll see us, you'll hear us. Cool. We'll cool. be in your face everywhere we can be. Do you have any of your music distributed to like Spotify or anything like that? Yeah, Flash Mob Series always on Spotify. Cool. I'll uh, I'll dig it up and throw it in a playlist for sure. Uh, I'll put some links to all this down below too, so at least you guys can follow Flash Mob Suicide and Screaming Artichokes. Um, there is still some dormant H Town Hooligans social media hanging out out there too. If it, I know they're if, still getting likes. And, I'm yeah, like, I, who's doing this? <laughs> it's so funny because every now and then it'll pop up on like Three Finger Betty's page or something where it's just like. This this band likes H Town Hooligans. You should like, and it's like, all right, fine, whatever. I guess you know they're not a band anymore, but rock and roll. Like, I'll give them give them the love, you know. And I mean, that was something I recently like took a bunch of videos off my old YouTube channel and put them on the Audible Farm channel. And one of them was like a song of you guys playing like Leaving H Town. I think is uh, one of the songs. There might be a cover or two on there as well. But um, well, I, I was working on um, redoing. Uh, <coughs> Leaving H Town, that song. Oh, nice. Um, Mike D, he he moved about two hours away, and uh, he's been working on it, seeing if he can't get, you know, up to snuff. Because mm -hmm. it was recorded back in the day, you know, when we didn't have all this. Yeah, know. yeah, he had like literally just a tape recorder, you know. <laughs> it was yeah, it was basically that. <laughs> yeah, you put the tape over the one end of the cassette and throw it in there and, and hit record. Not quite. Not quite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was old. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that's something else that's really crazy is it's just like the amount of technology, how far it's come, how easy it is to do things like this. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't I don't have it looks fancy, I guess, if you're watching, but it's really there's really not too much to it. And, you know, anybody can do a, a home studio these days. I was talking with Jesse Wilson about that on his podcast, how I mean, like if you have a laptop, it's like you're a hundred dollars away from a home studio. Like 
Yeah. Seriously, yeah. Like I don't know. I have the stuff, and I, I, the older I get, I just cannot get down and sit down and learn things like I used to, and I, and I'm just not good at it. Yeah, I always you, want somebody else to do it for me. <laughs> yeah, no, I get that too. That, it comes back down to like it's a billion times easier when you have, I guess the technical term might be producer or engineer, but when you have somebody else turning all the knobs, it's it's so much easier. Um, if you ever need a producer or tech guy, that Lane Bailey, yeah. Yeah. I'm plugging his name like a son of a bitch, ain't <laughs> Dude, where's, where's he uh, out of? He's over... Uh, I, I he's in Ashire. You ever heard of it? Uh, I've heard of it, but I, it's just a little town way over there. I just, you know, I felt pretty lucky finding this guy. I think I met him at a brewery public show and, and just happened to see him. I was like, this guy looks like he might play music. I'm going to go talk to him. Yeah. The next thing I know we're in a band. Oh, that's cool. That's really cool. Like once again, you know, going to a show that you're not even playing at and meeting people that aren't aren't even playing at the show <laughs> yeah. that's my favorite part of it all you know mm-hmm. yeah i mean i love live music of course but you know. yeah i mean that comes right back to you go to these live shows and you're just like man there's some of these people can rip though too you know even on the local scene it's it's pretty wild how how packed it is full of good musicians you know i don't i don't know if i would throw my name in that hat at all but like i go places and i'm just like I mean, obviously, in this podcast, a lot of people from this area are just like, Jeremy Ober, but, you know, like, I'm tossing out, like, the Chris Cars and everybody, like, Bruce Borchers, it doesn't matter who it is, you know, it's just like, these guys can all shred, and they're so they're super good, like, what, I don't know. I, I totally thought I knew East Side Window a little bit better, and yeah. every time he plays it, I sing right along with him, but yep. when we go try to do it ourselves, I'm like, yeah, oh, shit, even reading the words, I was like, okay. Yeah, <laughs> Dude, I will have to say, like, trying to pack all the words of East Side Window into East Side Window, it's like... Is this really the words of this song? You know, it seems like there's it's a, it's a mouthful coming out with some of these uh-huh. some of these verses here. But I didn't realize he was saying so much. Yeah, yeah. And actually, good job, Jeremy. Yeah, uh, it's, <laughs> that was something there. But also, like the way I cover East Side Window doesn't exactly sound. Uh, it sounds akin to how Jeremy plays it live, but not necessarily to how it sounds recorded. You know, I, I like it. A cover not to sound like the real one. You know what I mean? I think you always get a different take when you do a cover. And, uh, and that should be the way you go whenever you do a cover. Is We've already heard it that way mm-hmm. many times. Let's do it this way. Yeah. I mean, I heard Jeremy play it on an acoustic once and was just like, the way he's playing it now, I think I might nab that a little bit and put it on an electric and oh, see how yeah. it sounds. And it, it almost sounds a little Ted nugent you know? And, uh, yeah, I liked it. It was pretty fun because you start playing it and uh, Owen, the kid who was playing bass, I'll leave him, f- I don't I'll leave all the Man. underage kids first first name only. But uh, oh god, Owen's awesome. He's insane. But it was funny because he's sitting there and his somebody said was singing words to East Side Window and I was like, I know that. And I just like picked up the guitar and started playing along with it. And I started like saying a couple of the words because you don't really know what the song is until you say a couple of the words and you're just like, oh holy crap, you're playing East Side Window. And he just like plugs the bass back in and starts plunking along. You know how how cool would it be to be Jim or Jeremy and see somebody doing your songs I, I would love it if somebody covered one of my songs I think that would be awesome uh late night once at the junkyard I went up there and just kind of surprised everyone I was like I know East Side Window and Jeremy actually played the bass on it so oh. like it was pretty fun to have Jeremy like shredding the heck out of a bass on one of his own songs that he wrote and played guitar on you know so <laughs> there's another guy that's like kind of like what we were talking about Will he just he doesn't talk about himself much he's very you know very modest. Yeah, a hundred percent. You know, and it's just like yeah, I've always liked Jeremy. Yeah, you can tell that in some of his interviews because it's just like Jeremy, how how'd you get so good? And he's like, I don't know, I practiced. And it's like, fair, you know. I got a story about Jeremy. You want to hear it? <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, <laughs> is it podcaster friendly? No, it is. All right, let's go for it. <laughs> it's really funny because it, it 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 I didn't think he was that kind of guy at that time, but we were doing a show together, and we were over in we were doing it for the DC DC girls over in. Uh, was it Rolf? Rolf, I believe that, they were out of. Yeah. Well, you go into the rest of that, that school, and it was dark and scary, so we went ghost hunting. <laughs> but I didn't know Jeremy knew that. So we were up there ghost hunting, like going around and looking at shit, and Jeremy hid. <laughs> and I'm coming out of this room, and, oh, he jumped out, and he, he yelled so loud, and I, I jumped back about three feet, almost fell, and everything. It's probably the most scared I've ever been in my whole freaking life. Oh and he God. did that. I was like, I did not expect that from you. That's hilarious. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, he's definitely a fun-loving guy. It's I think kind I of a shit my pants. <laughs> it's kind of a tough nut to crack sometimes, but like, 
You know, he's even when I was playing in high school <laughs> and he was playing shows around the area with Brutal Republic as like a like a, when they were like a heavier like metal themed kind of band when he was younger. You know, I was in a punk band that played mostly covers, and he was like, "You guys could come play with us if you want." And it was just like. Uh, we should probably have some originals before we go anywhere, you know, we can't just go there and play covers before these guys show up, you know, but, you know, he's always been out there, like, inviting everyone around the area to play a show with him, and, I mean, it's only as of the last couple of years, it's, it's you know, absolutely no problem for him to fill four hours by himself, so he does that I now. don't think I can count on both hands how many shows we've done with him, you know, mm-hmm. he's always asked us, you know, you guys want to come play, you know, and I, yeah. Yeah, I mean, some of those bands are really, really awesome like that, where they'll take someone else under their wing and be like, We'll have you come play at ten, you know, ten, fifteen different places with us, and then you had the opportunity to get the booking yourself now, you know, because it's like they already saw you, you know, and they you got the booking, you know, because of Jeremy and you know, or or something like that, you know. And I've I've heard bands talk about that kind of stuff where, you know, it's like oh, we're gonna try and help out our our fellow bandmates that are from the area, and we'll take them and show them to some different bars and stuff, and then before you know it, it's like. Book your own shows, buddies, because you, you know, the crowd loves you, so it yeah. shouldn't be too hard to come back on your own, you know. It's nice to have people like that around the area kind of helping out and stuff like that. And uh, We've got uh, pretty close to an hour here. We covered most of the stuff I wrote down. Let's see here. Do-do-do, reading my notes. Yeah, um, yeah looks pretty good. Um, okay, see you later. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Billy, is there anything else you want to add? I'm going to throw social media for um, Flash Mob Suicide and Screaming Artichokes down below. And uh, yeah, anything else? Uh, no. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Billy, uh, thanks, man. I appreciate you, you know, taking the time to sit down with me. Um, it's glad to finally did it. Absolutely, absolutely, <laughs> dude. It's uh, it's funny because, like, like I said, it's we we talked about this for a long time and trying like, to get it done. You, and you should you should talk to so and so. They do it. Oh <laughs> well, yeah, he's, you're trying to push it off on everyone else you've ever been in a band with, you know, throughout history. It's just like talk to this guy instead. No, I don't want to talk. Talk to that guy. And I'm like. I want to talk to you. I want to talk to the man. So <laughs> we got the man here today and we're talking to him. But Billy, I really appreciate it. Thank you much. Thank you for having me. Yep. Oh, we finally had Billy on the podcast and it was a good one. It was a real good one. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Check out all of Billy's links down below. I'm sure there's more music that he's made that's been littered other places on the internet. But as of right now, uh, Screaming Artichokes and Flash Mob Suicide are his two current projects so I'll, I'll put the links down below to as much stuff as i can find down there uh check out that flash mob suicide album as well it's available on the youtubes uh for anybody looking up billy's stuff he does not have any dedicated um, musician pages but those band pages that's where you're going to find it so go check those out otherwise uh hit them up and maybe book him for one of those free shows he rumored i, I don't know maybe uh Maybe that'll be a really good thing for the area. Maybe it'd be a good thing for the band or exposure for at least a venue to have a band play for free. You never know. I don't know. Um, Especially nowadays, you know, everything's been getting pretty crazy with, you know, there's no real right or wrong way to eat the Reese's that was 2020. I'll tell you that much. Uh, Hit up Billy Lynn if you guys want to play some shows with him. Uh, Otherwise, you can find him clowning around at jam nights now. Maybe he'll come back to another jam night. It was fun to have him at a jam night. So, uh, Hats off to you, Billy. I'm, I'm glad you came on the podcast finally. You know, it took a little while to get him on here, but, you know, he's he's kind of one of those people that's not too braggadocious, doesn't doesn't want to be like, look how cool I am. So I also I enjoy that about him, too. That's one of the things I really enjoy about, you know, the modesty of some musicians that I've seen out there is, you know, we discussed that a little bit in the podcast. It's really, it's really quite heartwarming, you know. It's not always easy to be modest about anything, so... Hats off to all you guys out there being modest. I really appreciate it. Um, you're the real winners of 2020, in my opinion. So uh, shout out to you guys. Billy Lynn, great guest. Uh, find his stuff all over the internet. Links below. Uh, if you guys are looking for any more stuff to check out, I've got Audible Farm stuff. YouTube channel. There's uh, all sorts of videos as well as the podcast. It's available on the Audible Farm YouTube channel. There is the Audible Farm shop, which has Audible Farm merch if you're looking for t-shirts or hoodies. There's also stickers available there. Uh, we referenced a little bit in this podcast the video version of the podcast there will be clips available but if you guys want the full video version it's available on our patreon page so go check that out um I'm, i guess there's a link to it you know somewhere there's always a link to it somewhere otherwise just go to audiblefarm.com the links for everything are all there you can find out all the stuff we're doing where you can listen to us how you can listen to us uh, how you can share things with us and everything so go to audiblefarm.com check that out 
I've uh, been having a hard time getting guests lately. I've I've been going back through my old messages and sending out messages to people that um, either doing an interview kind of fizzled out or it was kind of tough to, to schedule things out or some people that I had just slipped through the cracks somehow. I found a couple messages in there that were about a year old. So I hope if you've messaged me and I, I haven't messaged you back, I apologize. I'm trying my best to, to do this all the best way possible. Some people are not too keen on doing Skype interviews and uh, I'm not too keen on driving halfway across the state and sitting in someone else's house. So we're kind of trying to figure some of this stuff out uh, the best we can as we go. Uh, If you guys are interested in doing a Skype interview, hit me up. All we got to do is just Skype and talk and I'll do the rest. So hit me up if Skype interviews are your thing or if you're in my area and you want to uh, sit down with me at, at my place and maybe do a podcast. Otherwise, Skype interviews are some of the best ways to go for me for now. So um, I still do enjoy doing face-to-face interviews, but not if I have to travel too much, um, you know, given the, the nature of the way things have been going this year. So um, if you guys want to hit me up, hit me up. I'm always open to do interviews with people. I'm, like I said, I've, I've contacted a handful of people in the last week that are uh, people that I don't know their music, and they've just been sending me links to their stuff, and it's pretty wild. I'm finding lots of cool stuff. So uh, hats off to everybody out there who's been sending me stuff. I didn't know. I, I thought for sure I was going to at least be 100 episodes in and have scratched the surface of the, the music scene in Iowa, but it's not even close. It's not even close. So um, on that topic, I do want to say there are other Iowa podcasts that are, are talking about music. So if you guys are looking for other angles on these things, some people uh, have been duplicate interviews from other podcasts, but I mean, I'm talking... I recently got into the Iowa Music Podcast. I had Mike Schulte on here. Uh, I dabbled in a couple episodes here and there, but I found myself um, with a lot of idle time and started listening to some of the podcasts. And I found myself listening. I listened to like six in a row or seven in a row or something, and I was just I was hooked. So if you guys are looking for some fun conversation that, about music that might not necessarily be about your home scene, but it could pertain to your home scene, I'd, I'd highly recommend checking out the Iowa Music Podcast, tackling all sorts of topics, um, such as what you're supposed to do with your social media, the best routes you can take with some of that, um, you know, booking gigs and, and how venues feel about the whole situation. I mean, I'm he, Mike does a great job on his podcast, so check it out, the Iowa Music Podcast. Um, just Google it, you'll find links to it. It's pretty easy. Otherwise... Um, Brutal Breakdown has not done an episode in a while, but that's still a good a good podcast. Beers with Bands is still cranking out episodes. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Inside the Music Room, there are the Indie Music Room with Heather Kelly. That's another one. Inside the Let's see here. Inside the Bird Room with Jordan Malin. Uh, there's a lot of podcasts out there. Uh, all those links are actually at audiblefarm.com. So if you go to audiblefarm.com, scroll down to the bottom. There's links to I guess you could call them our buddies. Uh, across the state doing things that are sort of similar to what we're doing but not exactly similar um, we're all tack- tackling different topics with different bands and different people from different angles and and uh you know like i said the iowa music podcast mike schulte he's doing a lot of like cover stuff there so check it out uh, there's cool stuff going on all over the state including right here in your area so uh check out billy lynn's links and check out all the rest and we'll check you next week peace